Chris Reisig, a U.S. operating partner with Jungle Ventures. And uh, as you all know, I'm doing a series of discussions with tech luminaries and leaders from the U.S. market um, in an effort to try to provide insights and ideas to our portfolio CEOs and operational leaders about all things uh, tech. And so today we are lucky to have a great guest uh, and a good friend of mine, John McMahon. And John um, has been a very successful CRO in his own right. And most recently, John has uh, served on several boards that you may, may be aware of. Uh, he's on the board of Snowflake. He's been on uh, several other boards. I'll let John introduce himself. Um, prior to that, John uh, and I worked together. Uh, I was lucky enough to work under John at PTC uh, early in my career. And I think um, John's been a great mentor to me, and some of the things I learned from John enabled me to go on and, and be uh, CRO at six or seven companies. And I know of at least 30 or 40 uh, other CROs that worked with John in, in various roles throughout his career who have gone on to create you know, tens of billions of dollars worth of value in the tech marketplace. Um, and there's countless others operating, maybe not at CRO level, but sellers and managers that have worked with John and learned from John. And so I'm really happy to have John with us today. Um, so John, welcome to the jungle. Thanks for being welcome here. Welcome to the jungle. All right. Yeah. All right. So um, maybe, maybe give a little bit of, of your current background, like what do you do today? And how do you spend your time? And just give yeah, like team so I ran sales at a company called PTC. Um, and most of these companies I was at at the beginning. So PTC, Geotel, Blade Logic, um, and then we got acquired by BMC Software. Um, and I was also at Ariba. So I've been the uh, CRO at like five different public software companies. Not as many CRO jobs as you did. Would you say, <laughs> two, seven? I still got to well, know who yeah, seven. Almost, six, almost six or seven are. And then, you know, then I decided to go help other companies out. So I've helped companies like HubSpot, uh, Glassdoor, AppDynamics, Snowflake, um, Sprinkler. Um, and now I'm helping companies like uh, also MongoDB. So now I'm helping yeah. companies like Drift, Lacework. Yeah, you and I work together at Drift. Yeah. Right. So helping companies like that right now. So I've seen you know, the, the growth of companies at all different stages of their, of their life. Great. Well, one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about is, um, as, as I shared with you, our portfolio, um, the typical founder in our portfolio, founder CEO is, you know, very tech centric, um, super smart. Uh, as you know, we focus on the Southeast Asian market and we're bringing more and more companies to the U S. And so, I wanted to talk a little bit early on, maybe through some examples about sort of how to think about the early stage go to market motion and how to think about positioning the technology um, from a sales perspective in an early stage company for a technical founder who may not have a lot of commercial experience. And so maybe we can go back to like the early days. Everyone knows about Snowflake because they just had an incredible IPO. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thank but, you. Um, maybe we can go back to the early days. Like, what was it like in the early days of Snowflake when they had an idea and they were productizing that idea? Maybe talk a little bit about the advice you gave them and how you guys went to market and what you learned through that process. That yeah. Helpful. Well, first of all, all all the companies that in the U.S. that I've dealt with are really the, kind of the same. Sounds like the same as the ones that you're you you guys are met, helping to advise. And they're, they're all founded by, you know, technology people that, you know, are well-versed in, in their discipline, but really don't know anything about sales or go to market. And one of the biggest issues that you face is those technologists have spent a lot of time with their, in their vision and in their product. And they really want to believe that their baby is going to be sold to everybody. Everybody's going to buy their baby. And it's true at some point. Like right now at Snowflake, everyone is buying the product. It could, you can sell it to every company. But in the early days, you have to be really honest about, you know, where, what pains do, do, does my product solve? And then where do those pains fit into what use cases? And who are the personas that own those use cases? 
and where are those personas located and what companies and what industries. So early on, as you know, at PTC, early on, we could only sit when we were selling CAD products, we could only sell to small medical device manufacturers and some consumer electronics companies that had simple designs, right? But eventually, almost every company in the world could buy, you know, Pro Engineer from PTC. And it's the same at, at Snowflake. Early on, we could only sell to tech and to ad tech. Now everybody can buy the product, but we have to be really smart because if you take, if you start to believe that everyone's going to buy your product right out of the gate, you're going to waste a lot of time and effort. You're going to burn a lot of money and you're really not going to be successful. And the world's full of technology companies that had great products, but really had a really poor go to market. It wasn't focused. And then, you know, they're not around. So unpack that a little bit more, John, like why was it so important in the early days of Snowflake to, why would you waste a lot of time and money if you tried to sell to everybody? Like what, what is it about that vision being so big that challenges the execution in the early days of a, of a startup? Let's say this, there's like three different things. One, the first thing that I basically referred to is what I call the ideal customer profile. So you have to figure out, you know, where is my product really strong? Where, where am I uniquely differentiated from the competition? Then you take that and you match it to, well, what pains do I solve inside these companies? And what use cases are those pains in? Who are the personas that own those use cases? And where companies are those people located in? And now I have to build a whole sales process and messaging on how to speak to those people in their language so that they understand that my product can solve their problems, you know, in a profound way. But and now the context, they, you're talking uh, about a small team, right? Five or 10 sellers, something like yeah, that. Five or 10 sellers. But even then right. it's so important to make sure that you're focused on the right. Cause if you think about an area like the United States, I could put people in 50 different States, but where, where <laughs> it's the old thing. Like, you know, in the U S we used to have this uh, in the 1800s, we had a, a bank robber called Jesse James. And he, be, he robbed like 35 banks at that time. And somebody had asked him now, Jesse, well, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. So it's the same thing when you're early stage of a company is you have to figure out where is the highest return for the investment that I'm going to make with my sales teams, right? And that isn't going to be every company. It's got to be focused on the companies that are going to get the highest return from the capabilities that your product has today, not the capabilities they have tomorrow. Now, let's say you build your ICP and then all of a sudden you have to basically figure out, well, what is the propensity of this customer to buy? So as an example, at MongoDB, we, if you were basically going to sell MongoDB's database, you would try to sell it to the biggest financial services companies in the world, right? Because mm -hmm. those guys have thousands That's and database. thousands of applications, right? That all need a database. Okay. Yeah. But what's the propensity of them to buy? So we did an exercise and we said, we need companies with really fast product life cycles. We need companies that are hiring the top developers. We need companies that have leading edge tech, only buy leading edge technologies and in a highly competitive space. Well, that's not the financial services companies. All of a sudden, gaming companies pop to the top. If they don't get the product out by Thanksgiving and for Christmas, <laughs> they might be out of business. They're hiring top right. developers. They're using leading edge technologies. And then we started focusing our salespeople on that. And instead of banging their heads against these big Morgan Stanleys and Goldman Sachs that could take years to sell to and maybe only come out with maybe a million dollars. We were going into the gaming companies and coming out with five and six million dollars within a couple months, right? So you have to think about one, the ICP, two, then figure out the propensity of these customers to buy and buy now. And then you have to figure out the sales complexity because as you know, even if, you and I were going to get a deal from a, a Morgan Stanley or a Goldman Sachs today, it would still take close to 90 days sometimes to negotiate the contract and get it through procurement, even yeah. after they to told us that we won, right? So Yeah, and 90 days would be doing well with those companies. Right, 90 days you'd be doing well. And you know how painful that is too. So 
I think these young, younger companies have to figure out, you know, who's really in my target market and where am I going to place my arrows to get the highest return on my investment. And did you have challenges? You know, one of the things that I've seen with some of our CEOs who are so smart and so passionate about their idea, like you said, their, their baby's going to sell to everybody. You know, that um, discussion of, of limiting the execution to a subset of their overall vision for now um, can be tough, right? Did, do you remember some of those conversations and, and how did those go and how did you deal with that? Because I see that in our own portfolio, trying to coach a CEO into saying, look, I know you can do X, Y, and Z, but right now we need to do just part of X because that's what's repeatable. Tell, tell yeah, us a little bit about some of those the experiences. conversation you just had, you know, if, if you don't, you have to, if you figure out that ICP and the propensity to buy and the sales complexity, it'll be pretty clear to everybody that, you know, we're wasting our time going after some of these other companies. Even if we got a yeah. deal, it's going to take too long to get the paper through and think about how complex it is to sell to some of these companies, even like a financial services companies, all these different departments reporting to all these different corporate structures. It's just the sales yeah, complexity sorry. is too difficult. And in the early stages of a company, you want deals. You want deal momentum. Why do you want deal momentum? The more deals that I can get as a sales team, I can give to development. And they figure out, even in this use case that we thought we were good at, we still have some missing pieces. But once right. we figure out those use cases, now we can just go down those bowling alleys, right? And then the product gets better by, you know, at, through that process. And now we can go into other bowling alleys and go down those bowling alleys too. Yeah. And I think it's important to remind founder CEOs not to confuse sales execution with painting the vision, right? So it's okay to have a vision, from day one that's big yes. and broad and you can sell to all these solutions over time, but sales execution kind of always until the company's really mature is a subset of that overall broad vision. Right. And that's important no for doubt. people to remember, I think. No doubt. So great, John, that's, that's helpful. Let's pivot to maybe another discussion. One of the things that you and I um, have spent a lot of time kind of working through and talking through is, you know, this idea of, of sales rep, to manager productivity. And there's a lot of contention in this particular area as sales teams grow a little bit bigger. So maybe in this situation, a company's exiting that sort of first phase of go to market and getting to a point where they're starting to think about scale. And they now have to build, go from three or four reps to 10 or 20 reps. And then what's the right ratio in your opinion at that stage, as someone starts to go to that scale, uh, between sales managers and sellers and, and why? Like, let's talk about that and unpack it a bit. Yeah. So the way to think about this, if you really wanted a hard, cold analogy is, you know, an enterprise salesperson in the U.S. right now, they're on target earnings. What they make when they make quotas, $300,000. So they're probably the fully burden cost. Let's call it 350 or 400, but let's stick with the 300. Let's say that you and I were general managers of a widget factory, right? And think about we're going to bring in machines that are going to pump out plastic widgets at the end of the day. And you're the general manager. So I bring in 10 $300,000 machines. So now we have $3 million invested in machines, right? Yep. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to do everything that we can to get those machines you know, hooking up the pipe, you know, the plumbing and the electrical and anything that that machine needs to get it up to 100% productivity as fast as we can, right? So we get every ounce of productivity we can out of that machine. And then we're going to monitor those machines constantly to make sure that none of them are falling to 70 or 80% efficiency. We're going to always try to keep them close to 100% efficiency, right? And we're going to make sure that none of them go down because if any of those machines go down completely, then you know, we're really not going to make money. our goals at the end of the year. So if we think right. about that, that's basically the way you, will, you would build like what I would call a productivity model. A productivity model basically says a rep comes in, and now how do you get them ramped up quickly? You, you do onboarding training to ramp them up as quickly as possible. In the enterprise world that you and I live in, that's typically six months for a sales rep. But if I can cut that even by one month down to five months, 
then I'm picking up a lot of productivity. So because let's let's go through numbers. Let's use something easy like $1.2 million a year. So $100,000 a month. And if I could do that across just 10 reps and I, and I can take their ramp time instead of six months to five, I just picked up $100,000 times 10. I picked up another million dollars in productivity. Now when, I'm, when they're on board, I'm going to try to keep their productivity as high as I can. Can I get it from 1.2 million to 1.3 million, right? And if I can do that, I picked up another 1 million. And if I can keep them from attriting because I hired the right people, I onboarded them correctly, I constantly train them and develop them, and I give them to the right leaders, I can prevent the attrition to make sure that we can make our, make our numbers. Now, as far as that, with that as a backdrop, think about the fact that these growing companies, for the most part, if you're growing really fast, almost everybody at the end of the first or second year is still relatively new. You don't have a lot of tenure in your organization. Right. So the, what you want to do is have managers and not think about them as a cost, but think about them as the people that are trying to increase the productivity of the people that they recruited. No different than the person that's making sure that these 10 machines are all running at 100% efficiency, right? Right. So sometimes you know, it almost doesn't make sense when I hear these arguments. <laughs> Let's say it's a uh, a hundred sales reps, right? And at right now the company's at seven to one and the CRO says, I want to go to five to one to make sure that I can keep these guys as, as productive as possible. What typically happens is the CFO is telling the CEO, you don't want to do that. That's too expensive. I say, well, wait a second. What if I could take the productivity from 1.2 million to 1.3 million across a hundred people? That's $10 million. Now, the difference at 100 reps at seven to one, that's like 14 managers, to go 100 reps at five to one, that's 20 managers. So we're talking about six managers, but I got to think that six managers aren't going to cost the company $10 million. So even say you go in only from 1.2 to 1.25, yeah. it's still not going to cost them $3 million for six managers. So right. I would advise people to start thinking about productive output, just like those widget machines. So, and, and efficiency, if I put these dollars in, how much return can I get versus only thinking about them as a cost? Does mm. that make sense? It does. And, and what do you think about, um, what's your rule of thumb for ratio in a, let's say a reasonably complex kind of multi-buyer sale with a high ticket value of, 100 to 250 uh, in SaaS recurring revenue. What's the rule of thumb kind of manager to rep ratio in a in a field based environment where they're not all sitting in the same office? To one. If it's in if it's inside sales, you can go seven, sometimes eight, maybe even a little higher. It depends upon your product and and your um, sales cycles. Are they short sales cycles? Are they long sales cycles? Yeah. Those types of things really really affect that also but I'd say five to one. Okay. Good. Good. That's helpful for, for our audience. So um, I'd like to get into one other area, which is uh, th this is a big area, but um, one of the things I notice in our portfolio early on as, as a company begins to start, you know, maybe they've done 10 or 15 transactions and they have, you know, 10 customers and they're starting to get repeatability. Um, you know, it's always a struggle to figure out, what's the right sales process to, process to employ and how do I build like a repeatable model that allows me to generate a valid forecast month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year. Cause at this stage of a company's maturation, that predictability is pretty important, right? It always is important, but early on, you know, you've got a board to answer to, you've got to project what you're going to do. You're maybe going out thinking about a, a subsequent round of funding which will be, of course, based on your ability to hit those forecasted goals. So how do you think about in the early stages of a company building that kind of repeatable sales and, and, and forecasting process and methodology? 
Wow, that's that is a big area. <laughs> that's a big question. Yeah. So let's spend a few minutes just chatting through what it well, is. Well, a lot goes into that. So first, sales process. You have to have a sales process, right? And then on top of a sales process, you have to have a qualification methodology. So the way that I think about it is, um, if you if I told you you're going to drive from Boston to New York, you would use Google Maps, and Google Maps would give you the most efficient way to get. And in the shortest time to get from Boston to New York, right? Now, when you're driving, you might think, I'm 10 miles right. outside of Hartford, Connecticut. But then you check your GPS and your GPS says, no, Chris, you're 20 miles outside of Hartford, Connecticut, right? And that think of the, the Google map as a sales process with the ideal, you know, turn by turn directions for a sales rep if they follow these turn by turn directions, they're going to get a deal in the shortest period of time and they will be successful as long as they don't skip steps, which happens a lot. Right. Right. Now, the second part is I want to be able to qualify as a leader in any part of the organization. Where are they right now? So when they tell, when you tell me about a deal, hey, John, I'm going to get this deal at XYZ Corporation, I have to figure out. Chris thinks he's 20 miles outside of Hartford, but is he really there? Or is he really 30 miles outside of Hartford? Did he already pass Hartford? So I have to figure out where the deal is so I can be able to, one, coach you on what you information you might be missing, who maybe you haven't spoken to, and also to try to figure out whether or not this deal is going to come in by the end of the quarter so I can forecast it. And for any company, forecasting especially software companies, forecasting is everything because software right. companies are mainly headcount. So as the CEO or CFO, I got to know, am I going to open up the spigot and allow more hiring to occur? You know, and that's got to be based upon the forecast. If I forecast really yeah. high and I come in low, I burned a lot of money. If I forecast really low and come in high, I got a lot of extra customers and I don't have the people to support them. Number one and number two, I'm not feeding my sales force so I can continue to grow. So forecasting becomes paramount. Did you want to go in a little right. deeper on right. sales process and qualification? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, I think so. Cause I think a lot of times our founders can sometimes conflate a sales process with a forecasting methodology. Mm. And I think it's important to sort of draw a distinction and talk a little bit about why those are so different and important in their own rights. Mm. Well, in a sales process, most sales processes, especially for enterprise sales might have like five different stages. Like you go in, you discover, and then you think, and in the discovery phase, you're trying to figure out, you know, is this customer buying what I'm selling? And then the next stage might be the scoping stage right. where you're trying to quantify the pain that they have. And you're trying to figure out maybe the as is process versus let's say the to be process, right? So that you can figure out some sort of cost right. justification because whatever you're selling them, there's going to be some sort of improvement. So there's going to be the before and there's going to be the after. And the way you, in which you're going right. to drive the average deal size up is by doing a cost justification. And from there, you got to make sure that <clears throat> that you you can get to the economic buyer to say, you know, are you really going to buy? If we can prove that our technology can do this, are you going to really buy for X amount of dollars at the end of this, let's say, proof of concept? Yeah. And then the proof of concept has to be nailed with your unique differentiators to make sure that you define the rules of the game and that you are going to win the POC, right? Mm-hmm. And then mm -hmm. from there, you know, you negotiate and you, and, you, and you close. And for each one of those steps, there's certain knowledge that your sales reps have to have, and there's certain skills that they have to have. It's almost like a game. Like if you were a coach of, a, of any type of sporting event, you know, no matter what play it is on the field of soccer, or ice hockey, or football, for each play, Cricket those players our, need to know that, what's, what's that? Cricket for our founders. Oh, cricket. All right, great, cricket. <laughs> so for each play, those players have to have 
a certain knowledge to pull that off and they have to have be very efficient in the skill set in order to be able to pull that off. And that's the same for your salespeople. For each stage of the process, there might be multiple plays in there. Do they have the knowledge and do they have the skills to be successful in there, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. from that sales process, there's some things that fall out of it. From a sales process should fall out your job description, right? If you think about each part of the sales process as having skills and knowledge in each stage, then that should fall into your job description instead. <laughs> instead of most job descriptions I read just says, blah, blah, blah. He needs to be a good corporate citizen and stuff like that. But it doesn't say anything about whether or not the person's going to be successful at the job. So here you get to compare somebody's resume or CV into what are the skills and the knowledge and do they have them and what type of risk am I taking if I hire this person, right? The other thing that falls out of a sales process is the ability to coach. If you see that your sales reps are getting stuck at stage two all the time, you know what knowledge, what you need to train them on, what knowledge or what skills you need to help them develop, right? Right. And then for qualification, you have to train your leaders and your salespeople on how to qualify each stage of those sales process, of that sales process. So you and I have used one called Medic, or I've changed it a little to MedPick, but that, that sits on top of the sales process and allows you to qualify. Are they in stage one? Are they in stage two? Okay, they're in stage two. Where are they in stage two? Who have they spoken to? What information do they have? What information are they lacking? What's the exit criteria for them to move to stage three? Have they fulfilled all of the criteria in stage two to allow this deal to move to stage three? Without those things being in place, it's really hard to forecast accurately. And you have to have, one of the biggest things that I find is when I go to a sales force, sometimes they ask me, can you sit in and advise us during a QBR or forecast session? The leaders are talking past the sales reps. What I mean by that is they ha don't have the same common vocabulary. So I'll sometimes stand up and say, well, wait a second. I've heard this word champions thrown around a lot. Can anybody in here describe for me what the definition of a champion is? And I'll get three different answers. So just the English language is failing them. Right. If you don't have a common vocabulary. Yeah. So you have to have a common vocabulary, yeah. a common sales process, a common qualification methodology. So everybody's on the same page. Otherwise, you'll find you might get five reps, 10 reps, 15, 20, maybe even 50. But you are not scaling past that without, some, without right. all of that core fundamentals being in place. So just to reiterate, I think what you're saying is that the sales process itself is kind of a mechanical playbook as it were that the sales team uses to execute sales campaigns with your company's product. And then the qualification process is really kind of a lens over the top of that, that the leadership uses to assess the qualitative elements of a given deal against that process, where it is in that process, back to the GPS example, Am I in Hartford or am I in New York City, right? And so there are two different things, maybe two sides of a coin is the, the way to think about it. One is the execution process. The other is a lens that's put over the top of that process upon which you can then kind of um, score each opportunity against where it is in that process. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So think of if you want to use cricket or any sport, think about it. It's the, the playbook is exactly that's the sales process. And then the, right. the film, maybe, you know, they've rec taken a video recording of, of the plays. And now right. you sit down and you can analyze where that player went wrong. Was he lacking in Got knowledge? It. Was he lacking in a skill? And it's not just for management, because if I can sit with my player and say, look at what you did here. This is what you did wrong. Let me coach you through how you do that right. The more that they can do their own self-analysis, is better for me as a leader or as a coach because my, the, my current reps might be my future managers, right? So I, yeah. I would prefer to teach them and let them be able to self-analyze themselves because any athlete that can self-analyze themselves is going to be a lot better than me always having to coach them on what they did right and wrong. 
Yeah, you want to teach them how to fish. Well, this has been great, John. This is uh, we could go on for hours and hours. There's so much is that it? to cover. Is that this is such a big and, and wide open discipline. I think yeah. so. I think this was great. This will be a lot of content for folks to absorb. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you, John. All right, you're welcome.